take care of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Exercise. Yeah. Get enough sleep. This whole idea of like Body this science and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. This entrepreneur that doesn't sleep and, you know, works 20 hours. All that's gone. That's just not true. There's no badge of courage for doing that. It's actually not smart. So take care of yourself. On the last episode, you talked a little bit about when we were talking about just, you know, building out your franchises and, and uh, from a franchise or franchisee perspective. And you talked about core values. And I think core values are, I mean, they are the fundamental ingredient to any successful organization. And it's not just words on a paper, words on a wall. Like they have to be lived out through the mission every single day. What, you know, for entrepreneurs that might be listening, um, whether they're fitness industry entrepreneurs or others, why do you think core values are so important? And, and, and how did you come up with the core values for your organization? Was there a process for that? Because, that's some, you know, we've got small business entrepreneurs here that are looking at it saying, OK, I think I know what my core values are, but why should these be my core values? Great question, first of all. And I think, you know, most core values, to your point, you know, they're just words on a wall and maybe these kumbaya campfire statements, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to really come up with your core values because it's going to take a lot of honesty. Yep. It, you know, get out of your business, get your leadership group together, sit yep. down somewhere and really dig in because mm -hmm. you might even examine, you may have core values now. And we've done this on several occasions where you really examine them. And it's, is this what we're really about? And you have yeah. to be brutally honest, yeah. right? Not every organization is the same and not every core value um, has to be, uh, you know, th the same as other organizations. I mean, it needs to be about your DNA, right? Yeah. Like, what are you, what do you think you can be the best in the world at? And what does that really mean to you, yeah. right? How would you describe that? And so yeah. it, it takes some deep work. So what I didn't mention on the last podcast is you've probably heard of EOS, which is the yeah. entrepreneurial operating system. Yeah. If for anybody listening that's got a small to medium sized business, I'd highly recommend leaning into that. It, you know, you can read the book Traction and get most of it, but you can also hire a local implementer, however you want to do it. Part of the EOS system is really identifying your core values. And then what ends up happening with that, Matt, is you, it's just a framework that anyone could use. But again, it gives you accountability to the framework. You could take that framework and then you can hire and hold people accountable. Say you're doing quarterly reviews, right, in your mm -hmm. business. That's what we do. Um, you can use your core values as, you know, as the sort of the measure, if you will, for hiring or if someone is still, yeah. you know, in alignment with your business. Yeah. And, you know, we do it with a simple like, um, you know, uh, either a plus, a minus, or a plus slash minus, which is like they're that way sometimes, right? Okay, that's good. So I, like it, that. yeah. I mean, if you take something like humor with a touch of crazy, it's like, all right, is this person like, do they have a good time, right? Are they yeah. fun to be around? And yeah. like, look, you're your finance guy and your legal person, maybe not as much, but they at least have to be. <laughs> <laughs> but they at least no need to have a plus minus. <laughs> next you're right. To their yeah, well, exactly. Like they're tolerant of it, but they're yeah. not probably coming up with the jokes, yeah. but they're they're tolerant yeah, of it, right? Yeah, yeah. But I think you know when you have a framework for <laughs> then how you how you you hire folks and then how you evaluate them on that, because you can sit down as a leadership team and say, okay, what about bill and sales? You know, it's like, okay, he's, he's crushing performance wise, which is uh, the metric in sales. Right. Yeah. But if you look at like one of our core values is unimpeachable character, you know, is he a good fit on the team? Because yeah. I don't care what you say, even if he's crushing performance, but he's toxic, yeah. not a good teammate, maybe some doing some things, you know, maneuvering around, sniping yeah. sales from others, whatever. It's it's going to be a detriment to your team yeah. long term. And it's really hard to say, OK, here's a high performer that is just he's you know, what is it like? It's tough. You want to get the right people on the bus in the right seats. Yeah. Right. So this is like a wrong guy. Right. Seat. Right. Yeah. But you can't yeah. have them on the bus. And and you the opposite of that would be like, hey, I've got somebody on the team. They're a great team player. They're not performing that well. So do we need to move because it's right person, wrong seat then. So do we need to move them to a different seat? I think those are just examples of how you use your core values, not only in hiring, but in your ongoing evaluation, because, you know, sometimes you're out your organization outgrows someone or maybe your organization pivots a bit, or maybe they have some things going on in their life. Um, you know, not personal things that you'll help them through, but they just change over time. Yeah. So it's good to review those. And if you have a really honest set and I would say, keep them simple. I like, you know, three to five tops. Yeah. Um, if you have those, then you can use those for your litmus test for literally everything in your business. Yeah. But this starts with really, who are you? You can't just grab some that you saw on a, on a corporate website that you yeah, think right. are cool because no one's going to buy in. That's You're right. not going to be backing them yeah. up. We literally use them in conversations, right? Yeah. You have to live them. Yeah. I was going to say, you have to live them out each day in your mission of whatever your business is doing. I mean, we'll say we'll be in a meeting and things get heated about this and that. And it's like, you know, sincere candor is one of our core values. And that means like uh, anybody on our team, 
you know, can give hard feedback to anybody else. There's not a hierarchy in these meetings. And I yeah. think that's important because if you it read is. like Patrick Lencioni's like five dysfunctions of team, the biggest and most, the hardest dysfunction to overcome is that peer to peer accountability. Mm. Right. Yeah. So if you can have sincere candor and hold it there and not get upset, like if, if me as the CEO and founder is called out by, you know, a, someone in a different department, but like Rick, man, that's not cool. Like we are supposed to be doing this and that, you know, I don't think we handled this situation correctly. And they say it coming from that place of that core value. You have to, I have to accept that. And yeah. actually you have to, I have to champion that. Right. Yeah. That's not good. easy to do No. So when you build those core values um, again, it, it just becomes like your, your compass for everything that you do. And it becomes your, again, your review process. And it's just, it, it's a daily conversation. And so if that, in that particular example, if it popped up, you know, then someone else on the team would say, Hey man, sincere candor, right? Like that's what it's about. Yeah. And the whole team. And that's when, you know, you're cooking with oil, when people are holding each other accountable yeah. to core values and they're buying into them. Yeah, that's that. probably my proudest moment as a founder yeah. as well. I'll sit around the table and I'll hear somebody say, Hey man, look, humor with a touch of crazy. Like if we can't have a sense of humor around this, like that's who we are. Like th that's not good. Right. Yeah. Like we can't work with this vendor cause they're, they're not fun or whatever yeah, that might be. I'm that. like, okay, cool. That sincere candor piece. Um, I've talked about it on prior podcasts where Ray Dalio, he has something in his organization um, that he calls radical transparency mm -hmm. and they have a system around it. They, they actually have a, uh, I think they've gone so far as, as I understand it, that they've got like a system in place where even after every meeting, everyone goes into the system and logs like how they thought each person in the meeting was, did problem, like that kind of thing. We every So we have a, a meeting at the same time of the week, every week, yep. 90 minutes. We have a framework for it. And the meeting ends with a rating a meeting. And if you rate it less than an eight, you have to say why. Yeah. And so sometimes people will say, well, it was a great meeting, but like, I mean, you guys put me under the microscope, like half the stuff that happened, you know, it wasn't me anyway. It was this other process. So I just, I just felt like you guys were picking on me. It really wasn't fair. And no one on the team's going to judge him for that. Like we, yeah. we are, we are promoting that. And so it's one thing to say it, Matt, but as you know, it has to be lived out oh, every yeah. single week in Oof. every single interaction yeah. with every, and listen, we're all human. Like uh, I might have an off day, yeah. right. And yeah. my sincere candor might come across as like radical candor to right, your point. Right, like right. you yeah. don't want to say it to hurt someone's feelings. Sure. Right. And I'm very yep. straightforward. So yep. it's like, if it's sincere, it's coming from a place of like, Hey, we're trying to move this. We're all going in the same direction, a common win, right. It's got to yeah. come from a place of caring. So. Uh, simple, but that. not easy. <laughs> yes, exactly. Simple, but not easy. Speaking of simple, you talked about simplicity and it being kind of front and center for you in, in your, your business and your business philosophy and, and keeping things, you know, simple. Talk to us about that. What is, unpack simplicity for us. And, and I think share with the audience why simplicity is so important in growing and scaling organizations. Yeah. I think the key word there was scaling. I'm glad you said that. Cause that's yeah. what I was about to say. Like, if you take, you know, we're in franchising. So it's like, we're, we're taking a tried and true business system, giving it to someone else. So there's a, another party involved. Yeah. Then they've got to take it into their local markets, hire a team because they're mostly investors. So they have to hire a team, pass that along to them. And then it has to be deployed to their local membership or client base. Right. There's a lot of layers in there. And so mm -hmm. if we had any complexity in there, it would be great if we had 10 locations, but you know, we're at a hundred already. We just got rolling. So if we hit our goal of 800 locations, the scale alone is going to create a ton of complexity. Like you don't need complexity, just put scale on anything. Yeah. And it could be the simplest thing in the world. And you put, you know, five steps removed and then 20 steps and 800 steps removed. It's going to be complicated. Oh, yeah. So it better be dead simple. No doubt. And I will tell you, there's so many, uh, I think we talked on the last podcast when we brought up this core value, Da Vinci, I believe said that is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Yeah. Um, Steve Jobs said that like a simplicity is very hard, but if you can teach yourself to think simply, you can move mountains. I mean, it is very difficult. Think, always think about it this way. Like think about your smartphone. If we talk about Steve Jobs, so you think about your, your, uh, your iPhone, like it's one thing to engineer it so that it works, right? That's pretty amazing. But I think it's even harder to engineer it so that I can hand it to my 75 year old mom and within 15 minutes, she can figure out how to use it. Mm. That's simplicity no and doubt. that's beautiful simplicity, yeah. right? That is so difficult to do. I love that. And, and I think that is, uh, I can speak from my own perspective as an entrepreneur growing businesses, um, we can get caught up because there's so many details. There's so many things. And if we get caught too far into, as, especially as a leader, at leading an organization, right, you can get caught up in too many of the details. The details are important, right? So you have to have a good team around you. The details are important, but you, you have to take a simplistic mindset 
about getting from point A to point B and point B to point C, or you're never going to scale. You're going to get caught up in a rut of all of the things that are, you know, that, that you may perceive ultimately as obstacles, which, which can be overcome. So that's, that's, that's great. So rumor has it that you've trained uh, some, some big stars. What can you share with us about that? Uh, whether it's people or I won't, I won't, I won't drop any names here, but uh, yeah, t- well, talk to me about that. You know, Matt, a gentleman never kisses and tells, That's right. but um, rumor has it that I, at one point I was Madonna's trainer ah. and my wife loves when I tell this story, the trainer that Madonna hired after me ah. fathered her oldest daughter. And I always tell my wife and I'll tell the audience, if I didn't have such (laughs) strong professional boundaries, that's right. Could have been me, (laughs) but it wasn't because I was, I'm a straight pro, Matt. I didn't go there. Now I always laugh. My (laughs) wife's like, I hate this story. So next I've told it a million times, but um, But it's a good story. But you know, when we first got started in personal training in 1992, people didn't even know what a trainer was. Like if it it was typically, uh, with females that were hiring us or like, you know, R and B artists, like, um, I'll tell you another quick story of course we could do this all day, but um, have you ever heard of uh, L.A. Reed? He's like a music mm-hmm. producer. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, at the time, um, you remember Pebbles? She sang, do you want to ride in my Mercedes? She was like oh, an yeah. R&B artist. So like yeah. that was his girlfriend. Okay. They had purchased a home close to our gym that had a studio behind it. And so they would come in. And I remember we had been open maybe six or eight months. I had done my Madonna stint. He reached out to the gym and just said, hey, look, uh, it's like a Tuesday. And he's like, hey, we have a photo shoot on Friday. We need to get ripped. And of course, you know, you can't get ripped in like four days. No. So I'm like, I tried to do my trainer guy thing. I'm like, well, you know, Mr. Reed, like, you, you know, you can't get ripped in four days. It's like, and he just interrupts me right in the middle. He's like, we'll rent your whole studio. I'll pay you whatever you want. I pause for a second. I'm like, come on in, man. We're going to get you we're so ripped. Get you ripped right now. <laughs> Nothing but salad in. and water for four yeah, days, that's right? That's right. <laughs> but that's what personal training was early on. And then personal training became something that like the average the average person, someone like me, is like, hey, this is a viable solution for health and which has caused forced us to have to scale it and and make it something that the average consumer could purchase. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you mentioned about your wife. So maybe this is a good, good, uh, good segue. Every entrepreneur is busy, right? We have a lot of things. We have a, a calendar that's packed. We have to feed into our team, work on our strategy work on scaling the business, um, putting out fires, right. As part of the, part of the, the job description sometimes, uh, maybe, maybe too, too often. How do you balance your kind of work home life? What does that look like? Cause you have children, right? I think your children, uh, they're, are, they're grown they're and grown. gone now, but yeah, they but, were, you know, obviously opened the gym before I ever had kids and, yeah. and our business went through all these stages and copious amounts of travel at times yeah, for me as well, international. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, certainly been through that. So what does that look like for you? Like, how did you, how did you balance that? And I think so many of our audience members who are even younger entrepreneurs or are trying to figure out what, why is this thing so important for me to make sure that I have that balance in life? And I think intuitively we know that. I talk about it oftentimes that it's uh, maybe less about balance and more about rhythm, like finding the rhythms that work for you at the different, because there's going to be different seasons of life where you're going to have different rhythms, right? So what did that look like for you? How did you do that? Yeah, I totally agree. Like you're going to go, look, let's back up a minute. So I think You know, you've heard these cliche sayings like you're the byproduct of the five people you spend the most time around. I think we all could agree that the most important relationship that you'll ever enter is with your spouse. I mean, this is a lifelong and it can be amazing and it can be terrible, right? It's it's the most important decision. So don't take it lightly. If you, again, if you're a young person in this stage, a good friend of mine, um, he and his wife are these sort of co CEOs of this amazing company. They exited for, you know, 60 some million in their thirties and just a super smart couple. They described it probably better than I've ever heard it described. And this is the way they described it. So they're like, here's the scenarios that we think work because they're like these co-CEOs. So think about like a sports team. So let's Mm. just use American football. So Mm -hmm. they're in the game at the same time. Like he's the running back. She's the quarterback, whatever that is. Right. So they go out onto the field and they're playing at the same time. And and that works if you can, you know, separate a little bit of the business, right. Mm -hmm. um, From your personal life. So that works. Now, the other scenario would be like quarterback cheerleader. So one Mm -hmm. of you is in the game. And the other one is the cheerleader. And if you think about that scenario, you know, the cheerleader's never going to try to pull the quarterback out of the game when it's fourth and goal, right? So if you think about these seasons that you mentioned, maybe you're in a big push and you're and you're launching a new product or you're starting a new business vertical and you're going to be really busy. And so the, your cheerleader, whether it's the man or the woman, needs to understand that, be tolerant of it and be willing to hold down the other responsibilities sure. in the household yeah. while this person's out. They're never going to ask you to come out of the game at the most critical time, yeah. right? Yeah. The other one would be you've got two people in two different business 
you know, verticals. Like yeah. one is, is in there in business and the other one's here and you respect each other's time and you just share duties, right? Yeah. The only time you run into trouble is again, if you have sort of the quarterback, the cheerleader scenario, but that person's not backing you, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah, and they're clamoring tough. for more time. Yeah. I think, you know, I just open discussions, understanding, like if you have even personal core values, like entering into these relationships, like, who are you? Like, are you both going to be involved in this business? Is one going to be like home cheering on the other? And if so, like, you really got to understand what that means, right? Yeah. There's going to be seasons, as you mentioned, where you're not going to see that person as much, or they're going to be on the road or whatever, and you're yeah. going to have to hold down your duties. And sometimes that can feel unfair. Like, well, you're doing these things. I'm doing those things, whatever those things are. So it's not easy, but I think um, but communication, right? I mean, communicating it, that's the key, getting clarity in how that spouse, um, you know, wh how they perceive what the situation is, how they perceive it and making sure that you're communicating and providing clarity and getting that common ground. I mean, you're married, Big right? Time. In that, in that instance. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I've had, I've had like my wife on my podcast and we've just talked about what's it like to be the spouse of a crazy entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. And she's like, well, you have to understand that like there's different times. And, and so there's an understanding there to your point. I think it's open communication. Right. And again, if you're going to talk about, uh, you know, a cheerleader and football player might not be the best, best description, but I think it makes sense that, you know, someone is really supporting the other person. They would never pull you out of that business venture at a critical time because they understand what you're trying to do. And and when that happens, you can see that it is very difficult because I've I have friends that are entrepreneurs and they've been through tough spots with spouses and yeah. maybe they aren't with them anymore because they're just not aligned. Maybe they didn't yeah. start out that way. And all of a sudden they launched this new business venture and the spouse is like, well, you're not ever home anymore. And who's taking the kids to practice tonight and all yeah. those type of things. So it's yeah. like, to your point, I think open communications, but that's the key. I don't know that balance is a realistic expectation. Correct. I think seasons is the best way I've heard it described. So yeah. props to you for that. I think there's times when you have lots of time and there's times when you have no time at all. Yeah. And as long as you're open with communications, you've got the right partner who can understand that. And you guys have worked out your dynamics of who's doing what. I think you'll be fine. But I shooting for perfect balance all the time is, is just unrealistic. You've talked a lot about mindset and why mindset is important. So are there things that you do to ensure that you are feeding yourself to create a healthy mindset and a mindset that allows you to even, even in the midst of the deepest valleys or the obstacles that you're faced with, that you can have a mindset that will allow you to push through that. And, and I'm just, you know, what do you do to feed yourself? And, and are there some tricks of Rick's trade here that, <laughs> that allow you to prosper in that area? Well, I got a couple of things. I think just on the basic level, take care of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Exercise. Yeah. Get enough sleep. I mean, yeah. this whole, like this whole idea of like Body this science and stuff, exactly yeah. this entrepreneur that doesn't sleep and, you know, works 20 hours, all that's gone. That's just not true. No. And, and, you know, there's no badge of courage for doing that. It's actually not smart. Right. Yep. So take care of yourself, right? Exercise, try to eat as well as you can, get enough sleep, pour some time into that. We talked about how critical that spousal relationship is. Yeah. You know, do some weekends away, work with, you know, do a date night, get some counseling if you need, whatever that is, really work on that relationship. If you're spiritual at all, pour yourself into that. You know, nothing like humbling yourself and feeling like, you know, your problems aren't unique and that you're not the most important thing in the world, right? Because it can feel that way. You feel like I'm the only one in the world going through what I'm going through. Not true at all. Mm -hmm. Peer groups are big. So if you can get into mm, a coaching really group, good. right, yeah. you can get into some kind of coaching group. Yeah. Um, I think when I first was really leaning into my entrepreneur journey, when we started licensing to this concept we had to all these clubs all over the world, I joined Vistage Group, which is a worldwide, yeah. you know, it was great. I was on this Vistage Group with guys in different businesses. And you start to look around and you think, wow, everyone has the same challenges I do. I'm yeah. not that unique, right? That's right. Yeah. These are very common and it's very calming to feel that way. It and is. you can talk about things in those settings. You're not and alone. Exactly. And, and you've got other entrepreneurs and they mm. all have the same mm. issues. And you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm not an oddball. Like we all have these yeah. challenges, yeah. right? So those are just a few things I do. Like peer groups are great. Um, any kind of, if you're spiritual at all, lead into that as a, yeah. as, as a basis, right? Yep. Um, work on your spousal relationship and then take care of yourself physically. I mean, that, that's about it really. Are you, are you reading any, uh, any books right now? Anything? Are, are you a book reader? I, don't know I am. Are you, I is am. there any books that you're reading right now or any books maybe that you've read that are like, Hey, this book was transformative for me. I think, look, I'm in franchising. So I tend to read things that are from sure. a business standpoint, that makes sense, either yeah. leadership or that. I love the E-Myth Revisited because like uh -huh. in franchising, it speaks about the beautiful, the beauty of systems, you know, like you can be, let's use these hamburgers. Like you can be, I think they use that in the, in the example in the book. You can be the world's best hamburger place and just have one location. And that there is beauty and, and something really interesting about that. You can also be McDonald's and serve the same hamburger in Atlanta that you can in China. Yeah. And it tastes the same. There's also beauty in that. Yeah. Right. And so like understanding to build systems around even soft touch things. Right. Yeah. I think it's key. 
Um, I'm a big fan of the Stoics, so I read a lot of just Stoic philosophy. Yeah, I think it's a it's amazing that 2,000 years ago, the most powerful people in the world were writing essentially diaries. If you read the diaries of Marcus Aurelius, he's writing a diary yeah. to himself yeah. in Greek, which at the time Latin was the language, but yeah. Greek was this eloquent, beautiful yeah. language that was used in you know in poetry and whatnot. He's writing diaries to himself that he never expected anyone to read in Greek, and he's talking about things you know the value of doing hard things. The value of being humble, the, you know, just things that you would never imagine someone who was actually considered a living God, who had a group in Rome dedicated to worshiping him as a God would sit in his quiet time and talk about being a decent person. Right. Yeah. And the value of doing hard things. Yeah. And it's 2000 years ago and it's so relevant today. Oh, it is. So I love stuff like that. I think society today and particularly our younger generations, you know, they try to lean away from, oh, it's difficult. And so I don't need to, I don't need to go in that direction. That's too, that's too hard. And that's a dangerous, slippery slope, right? And it's better to lean into, we, I mean, we get, so, we gain so much value, we gain so much perspective, um, and ultimately we build up the necessary and Angela Duckworth talks about grit and grit being the number one element and ingredient for, um, successful entrepreneurs and if you're not leaning into the tough stuff, you're not getting grit. Well, it goes back to, grit. you know, um, there's a guy, he has a website called The Daily Stoic, Ryan Holiday. Okay, he's yeah. written The Obstacles the Way. He's yeah. written a bunch of other books around stoicism. But The Obstacles the Way, there's great stories about, I think Nick Saban gave it to Lane Kippen, right? The football coach. And he said it was the most impactful book he'd ever read. It's, it's basically speaking to exactly what you said, Matt. It's like lean into the hard stuff. And what you'll find is the way, the path through is the hard stuff. It almost goes back to some of the other things we talked about on this podcast and the prior one, where you have to learn that the daily struggle and the grind, that's what it's all about. It's not the end game, aim as high as you can, and then learn to embrace the process itself. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a diff, it's, it sounds like a simple concept, but it, it can be difficult to, to your point, not to run away from the obstacles, but to try to go right through them. And in doing so you are achieving the exact yeah. goal that you want. Right. Love so, it. But, uh, you know, I gave the diaries of Marcus Aurelius to my son and my daughter and her boyfriend, and I gave it to everyone for Christmas. So I'm like, listen, it's a great toilet reader. Just read a chapter a day. Yeah. It's going to change your life if you can lean I into this that. a bit. Yep. That's great. When the books at the end of your life, when the books are written about Rick Mayo, what do you hope that the author and the people who contributed to the book say most about how Rick had an impact on the lives of other people or what do they, you hope that, that it says most about Rick? You know, maybe that I, that I showed up, mm. you know, that you just showed up to life. Yeah. And there's so many people in your life that need you to do that. Yeah. Right. I think, um, you know, everybody, everybody craves to be seen, I think. And if you can be that person who can provide that, if they feel seen when they're in your presence, whether they work with you, spouse, kids, like you really see them. Right. And that's different. Yeah. You're not talking at them talking to them and you really yeah. see him that I would just want people to say, you know what? He was a solid guy. He really showed up. And yeah. that means to w whatever that meant to them and the nature of our relationship. I think that would be really important for me. I think that's very important. Thank you. That's good. Hey man, thanks for joining us today. Cheers. Thanks for having me yeah, back. 